What do you think? Is George Lucas just a fucking thief or what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I think you can definitely see that uh, some inspiration for aspects of Star Wars might have come from this movie. That's a very generous way of putting it. Let's call a spade a spade here. The Phantom is just fucking Darth Vader. That's all this is. <laughs> yeah, I think the Darth Vader uh, voice and even some of its costuming definitely got... Uh, some of? He's got the fucking box in the chest. He's wearing all black. Like He's, he's got, got a, helmet. a cape. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of it there. Yeah, you're right. Uh, I definitely see that. Uh, we're De Palma and uh, Lucas Friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Contemporaries. So then you, you definitely, um, after watching this, uh, can see where those kind of ideas came from. There's a pretty straight line, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. It's borrowed from this, for sure. Or it worked in the theme. I mean, not quite as science fiction-y, obviously, this movie, but... Uh, well, I think he's a fucking thief. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome to Bad Movies and Beer. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And this week, we are discussing Phantom of the Paradise, Brian De Palma's glam rock version of phantom of the opera which uh this is just so indicative of like the era it was made eh with the costuming and the music and the yeah and the, yeah. the clear winds of cultural change yeah <laughs> you see that right at the beginning right we we break in and they're giving us um sort of a very uh 50s-esque feeling and then it's going to transition really quickly from there oh yeah the times they were a changing and that's what we're going to uh talk about today in this one but first before we get into the movie what beer do we have this week noah yeah so we always pair a beer with our movie and uh this one is a pretty good luck our, our beer is called paradise uh, it's a lager by grove brew house out of kingsville ontario which uh this place um, where it's created, Kingsville, used to be called Paradise Grove. So uh, a pretty good connection to um, the sort of place in our movie uh, that one of our main characters tries to create, uh, that sort of uh, utopia for musical performance. Um, so this brewery's been around for about four years. Uh, they have uh, a pretty wide selection of uh, seltzers and beers available. I've never been, but uh, they're currently in the process of creating a new place. So they they got a new brew house coming up. So sounds like that's going to be available for people to visit soon. So I'm I heading out there this summer, so I'm going to try to take a stop and visit uh, Grove Brew House. But I'm excited to try this one. You said you've had a couple of their beers. Yes, yeah, so uh, I've had a peach sour that they made that was pretty tasty. And I've had a couple of like pale ales, IPAs. They do a one, it's called Tart and Soul. It's like a mango IPA, which you know me, not a big IPA guy, but I do love fruity sours. This is kind of a nice combination of both. The mango does a lot of heavy lifting, gets rid of that some of that horrible IPA flavor for me. So I enjoyed that one. But no, I think they have a lot to offer. So I think if you, you'll find something you enjoy for sure. Let's get into this one. Absolutely. So we open after the 20th Century Fox fanfare with a Rod Serling-esque voiceover telling us all about the mysterious swan a decorated music producer who we are told is basically responsible for all the popular music of the last 20 years. He is looking for the new fresh sound and he's going to find it at the paradise, which we are told is going to be the ultimate rock venue. <laughs> yeah, they are really hyping this one up. I think they gave him credit for like the Beatles, the Beatles, yeah. all rock sound, the combination of folk and rock music coming together uh, in harmony. He's basically like the Messiah of music. Yeah, although your statement is a little bit ironic, considering what we find out in the end. <laughs> Absolutely. And so there's some high expectations here. We transition from this intro, we're learning about him, into a performance already. Yes, by his current group, the Juicy Fruits. That's that kind of uh, retro 50s doo-wop. They're greasers. We'll just say they're greasers. <laughs> uh, certainly that time period of songwriting... And it's usually a sort of like a heartbreak kind of experience song. I guess oh, yeah. connections to country music in there as well. This performance is kind of funny though, right? It's it's not unentertaining, but then we get members of the crowd starting fights and like forcing themselves on women. Members of the group, not the crowd. There's the two backup singers in the group. There's a the main singer and he's going through this like lengthy monologue about what's happened to this Eddie guy. And the two guys singing backup, one of them like tries to grope a woman, he mounts her, he ends up with her bra somehow. It's like really strange. They're making strange facial expressions. Yeah, it's it's quite the performance. And they're doing it to a very small crowd, right? Like there's not a lot of people here. Um, I guess what they're trying to show is that the paradise hasn't been created yet. The whole goal of this is for Swan, right? Our music producer to make his sort of mecca of music. And this isn't really where they're at yet. 
Um, but the performance goes well. He gets the band gets a clap from Swan. They get his approval. Oh yeah, there the people were waiting for that too. There's a buzz in the audience. Oh, what's Swan? I think it was Swan. And we just see the white gloved hands drift into frame and like give them a little slow clap. Swan is off screen at this point. You know who didn't enjoy their performance though? The very bookish looking guy that we see halfway through their number there, pasting a sign up over their Juicy Fruits name that says Winslow Leach on the piano. And this is how we meet our main character. <laughs> yeah, this is a funny introduction. It's interesting here how Swan, they're not showing on screen. I was trying to figure out if maybe Swan was the Phantom. Like I was trying to see, mm -hmm. and that's why they weren't showing him, if there was something connected here. Um, but quickly that becomes clear that it's not him. We also get introduced to Swan's sort of uh, right-hand man, the person who does all the dirty work for him. Oh, dirty work is a good term because this guy is a fucking sleazebag. Yeah, yeah. Of, of the highest order. I think it's Philbin, right? Arnold Philbin, a particularly slimy-looking guy, who uh, his the whole reason he's there is to ask Swan to basically crush a female singer's career and dreams because he brought her up and was not able to exploit her to his satisfaction. And Swan says, don't worry about her. She's going to be falling off anyway. Yeah. We don't need to, to do that. But we clearly see his sort of intentions and character very quickly. And that's fulfilled throughout the movie. Yeah, I can only assume this is on some level a commentary about the nature of the music business and probably the movie business also. But you know, we'll get to a little bit more of that later as well. Their conversation's interrupted when Swan hears something that really catches his ear. It's the music of Winslow Leach at the piano. He's captivated and declares that this is the perfect music to open the paradise. Now, Philbin isn't impressed with the singer, but Swan makes it clear that it's the songs he wants, not the singer. Yeah, he doesn't really care about Leach himself. He just wants to take his music. Um, and, I mean, Leach would love to be able to play and sing and share his songs, but uh, I don't know that it's going to turn out the way that he imagines here. No, and this would be a good time to mention, like I referred to him earlier as kind of bookish looking. Like this guy, I asked you while we were watching this, your thoughts as like for the lead actor in this movie, for the protagonist, weird casting choice, no? Yeah, I think they they wanted to find somebody who was more talented rather than handsome, I think. Well, they succeeded. Yeah, they were looking for an idea, I think, of someone who had all of the skills but not the looks that was required to be successful in a music or movie industry. And I think it's easier to take that character and turn them into something later, right? Yeah, he's got, you know, kind of this like curly mane of hair and these big glasses and his way of speaking is very kind of like stilted. And I don't know, it, it seems like for someone who's writing songs and wants to perform, lacking a little bit in the confidence department. Yeah, he comes across more almost like a mad scientist than he does a music performer. That's a great comparison. I he think. doesn't yeah. have any charisma, right? He has these huge, like very thick bottle glass glasses and he... Um, clearly is talented musically and clearly has a lot of knowledge both about music and about sort of lore and history. We find out that the music he's creating is sort of an homage or a story about Faust when someone sells their soul to the devil. Definitely. Now, Swan finds this out later after he sends Philbin to try to get some of Winslow's music. Winslow's hesitant to part with it, though, especially when Philbin suggests it could be performed by the Juicy Fruits. He is absolutely incredulous, grabs Philbin and says, I'm not going to let my music be mutilated by those priest balls. I'm the only one who can sing Faust. Which is pretty funny. <laughs> uh, Philbin backs off and instead promises that they'll produce his album his way. He also points out that Winslow has quite a temper. Foreshadowing. Just a little bit. This, uh... He manhandles Philbin, who is not a small person himself, right? Oh, no, Philbin's a big boy. But, I mean, he seems also like a coward. Yeah, no, it's true. But I think that is sort of a bit telling. And you're right, that's going to come back. And we're going to see more of this later. Definitely. So, as you mentioned, he's written a cantata telling the story of Faust, which, again, they are clearly alluding to something here. And Winslow cannot wait to tell his story. But, as we see one month later, he's still waiting he enters the offices of Death Records to find out what the holdup is, but they won't let him in. The secretary finds his name on the never-to-be-seen list, and security throws him out. <laughs> this is funny. It's almost like a Rolodex. Yeah. She kind of spins through the names on there, and she finds his name. And when she flips to his page, it's just two words. <laughs> <Right>? Yeah. <laughs> and then they kick him out of this kind of 
futuristic. This is almost like a science fiction e building. Yeah, but the way they came out, it's like the film is sped up. It's like the old Benny Hill thing. Like he's trying to run through these series of doors while the two security guys try and like get him, but they can't go through the same doors as him. It was like weird, almost like slapsticky comedy in the middle of this. Yeah, it's kind of strange tonally here. Um, and it, yeah, it's one of those sort of spinning doors, and it, they get it stuck, and it won't go. And you're right, the speeding up of the camera is strange. To so do a little bit of play with. Um, the speed of camera in here. And, a few times, and yeah. Sometimes it works well, and in this time, I think you're right. It seems weird tonally. Now, he's not going to give up that easily, so what he does is he waits outside the building until he sees Swan leave, then hops in a taxi and tells it to follow that car. When the car stops, we see that Swan is attending an audition. There's a whole bunch of female singers, and you'll never guess what music they're auditioning with. It is his. Of course. All the work that he put into this uh, cantata he wanted to see that through, and all of these women are practicing to sing it. Most of them are butchering it horribly. But not one of them. Mm, someone catches his ear. Yes, very much so. He uh, locks in on her, and he thinks she's doing a fantastic job. See something very special in her. Now, because he's a rube, he doesn't realize that he's been swindled. He thinks this was some kind of miscommunication. So he tries to follow her into the audition, but once again, they throw him out. And we see why when he gets a look through the oddly small door, as the only thing being tried out today is ladies' vaginas. <laughs> yeah, this is a... It surprised me um, when we got to this scene because when they pull the women through to the audition area, immediately they're thrown on the couch with that greasy... Um, producer guy Philbin. It's not even Swan. It's his sort of like... Oh, no. Philbin's the gatekeeper. Yeah. yeah. He gets to see them first. And then after that, ladies end up on a much bigger bed together waiting for Swan. Yeah, this part was confusing to me. It almost felt like a dream sequence. We cut from that scene. Oh, and the girl uh, that he had his eye on storming out because she won't sleep with uh, Philbin. She's got integrity, you see. Yeah. So she we they sort of established this really early that this character, Phoenix, won't sort of be a part of that aspect of the music scene, right? Most of the women we see here are willing to do whatever is asked of them to get into the music scene, but uh, the Phoenix character, she's not. She's got higher standards than that. She's really all about her voice, um, and we're going to see whether that holds true or not later. The music going into this scene is interesting. There's a song being sung about going to meet the devil. Yeah, again, they're <laughs> subtlety. And, Subtlety. Well, it's interesting because having not seen this before, it took me way too long to figure out aspects of what was happening here. And looking back at my notes, it's funny that I have those written down, but it didn't click didn't yet. Click, so yeah. it's funny, yeah. Well, maybe that means they did a good job. Or you did a bad job. I don't know. It's one, it's one <laughs> or the other. Uh, it's probably in between. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the part I was talking about. From here, we get this transition where it almost seems like a dream sequence because there's a room with a giant circular bed this is like swan's uh hump pad to borrow a phrase from heart condition which we watched earlier this season <laughs> and all these women are there basically talking about how they're gonna like get drilled by swan and how swan's video recording all of this and they should like do stuff with each other and like but then inexplicably right in the middle of all these women is winslow he's there uh in a dress i guess he had to put that on to sneak in and he somehow got past what must have been blind guards he has a flower in his hair. Yeah. Like, he somehow fools them to get in. And he's hiding in there. A few of the girls are, like, starting to make out with each other. And then who walks into the room? We finally get to see Swan. And, man, does he look weird. What a weird-looking guy, right? I was not expecting this. Yeah. Like, I really thought it would be someone different. I don't know why, but we had a very, like little androgynous person. I was going to say, you thought he was a woman. Yeah. And so did I. The first time I watched yeah. this, I was like, is that it? Like, maybe it's because we just watched Theater of Blood with Diana Rigg and like dressed up as that guy for Vincent Price. Uh, yeah. We yeah. got some of that sort of still sitting there. And I know that androgyny was a large part of this kind of 70s style and look, but it was very difficult to tell. And like you were sort of ragging on the character they chose to be the singer, right? or the actor they chose, and I was sort of similarly confused about the swan casting, if this is sort of the most magnificent person, but I guess it wasn't about what they look like, it is about their achievements that they were able to have, right? Yeah, I guess so. Swan immediately figures out that something's wrong here, because Winslow's like, oh, Mr. Swan, it's me, and he just tosses him out right away, has him framed for drug possession, but this is what I was thinking, he basically wakes up outside, he's been beaten, he's got the dress on still, and they check his purse, and inside they find a bunch of heroin, some cops do, did the whole thing on the bed really happen? Or did they do that to him when they tossed him out of the audition? Do you see what I'm saying? Like that part could not have been a dream he had unconscious 
from the audition? Because how does he get in that room? Well, the only reason I think it's not a dream is because when he wakes up with the, like, beat up, he is wearing the dress. And oh, they could have thrown a dress there. on him to, like, you know, make him more and likely. And the flower is mangled because it got beat up? I don't know. I don't, I just, I, how does he get in that I, room? No, I think it's real. I think that the scene happens. I think that he does sneak in there somehow. They take him out through a weird, like, hole in the floor. Yeah. He throws some, like, homosexual comments at him, of course, because of the time period. The cops are the ones that put the heroin in his purse. Well, this is all a frame job, you know. Swan's made this happen. And from here, things escalate quickly. Much like Winslow's reaction when he's sentenced to jail time. He turns to the camera and he's like, But I'm innocent! Swan stole my music and framed me! <laughs> it's like it's right into the camera. It's so weird. Yeah, this is a big yell into the camera. This whole section, it's only about like five minutes. Less. It's like two minutes. It goes so fast yeah. and so much happens. Like, oh my God, yeah. He's sent to Sing Sing, the like maximum security prison, where he's told that he's volunteered for a special program sponsored by the Swan Foundation. What a coincidence. They take his teeth... Then we jump forward six months and he flips out while working the prison assembly line, manages to escape from jail in a box, breaks into the death records office, tragically slips and falls into a record press, then stumbles out into the night and falls into the river, presumably never to be seen again. And yeah, like you said, this all happens in like two minutes. It's insane. It's it's almost like a montage. It isn't, right? But it is close to that. So much action happens. I guess they didn't want to spend a lot of time on the characters sort of toiling in prison. I felt like it was so fast. I also it thought it was hilarious that he like beats up this guard and then somehow climbs into a box that then gets shipped out of the prison. Yeah, yeah. and that's <laughs> his escape, right? Like nobody tells on him or nobody like they all pack him up and yeah. then send him out there. How about him falling into this record press though? Like that's ridiculous. His shirt gets caught and then he tries to flee and he can't and he, he slips slips on a record on the ground yeah. and falls back and then his head falls in right when it's closing and it like presses his head. It was ridiculous, but yeah. also kind of well done. As he's stumbling out... That part was cool, yeah, yeah. You get this cool shot of him covered in blood, and his face is kind of steaming or smoking. Um, so I actually really, really like that part or that yeah. scene. Then, yeah, he heads off into the river, and then we get a cut to a newspaper to sort of tell us what's going on next. And I like this. I like that kind of... Yeah. Transition or cut that way. We get the newspaper insert a couple of times here. Uh, this one was this one didn't spin, right? The one later no. on spins like the yeah. Batman thing. But <laughs> yeah, this is an insert. Tells us two key pieces of information. The headline lets us know that the Paradise is about to have its grand opening. And below that, we see a short little piece that details the death of musician and convicted doper. That's the words they use. Winslow Leach. But as we see in just a second, he is anything but dead. Yeah, we're about to get a point of view shot of our new Phantom of it's Winslow. It's like the serial killer, like the heavy breathing as he moves through the halls. And yeah, yeah, which is interesting. We haven't had a lot of camera angles from that direct perspective yet. We can tell he's sort of struggling a bit because of the way that he's breathing. He finds his way to the paradise. He scares away some people guarding because of his mutilated face um, and makes his way where? To the wardrobe department, he finds a little <laughs> cloak for himself to wear, and he finds a kind of helmet mask that's going to become his look for the rest of this movie. So yeah, he's not dead, but you know who is? The Juicy Fruits, as Winslow, as the Phantom, plants a bomb in part of their like stage set that blows them to pieces. Now, this whole sequence happens in split screen, so we get like an emphasis on the musical performance on one side while also kind of seeing different characters' actions and perspectives on the other side. What a strange but interesting choice. Yeah, and we talked about it a little bit while we were watching because I, I was asking how often this kind of happens, and it's not very often, I don't think. Like, I found it almost hard to follow because the music was happening in one section and then the talking and the direction was in the other one. It made it a little bit chaotic for me. And I think as we progress in this, they make the shooting and the scenes and the things that happen more chaotic on purpose as it starts to fall apart here. Oh, yeah, we get that at the end, a ton. Quick cuts and sudden, like, jarring transitions and, like, voices coming from different directions and stuff. It's very, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, definitely. So Swan, who we were told earlier, records everything. He spots the Phantom in some of his footage and immediately pieces this whole thing together. Like immediately. The Phantom <laughs> grabs him and he's like, Winslow Leach, as I live and breathe. My thinking from Phantom the Opera is that the Phantom takes a while before it, it reveals itself to everyone who's there, right? And here I was like, oh, so Leach is going to sort of do a bunch to stop the opening of this new like spectacular musical venue. Uh, but it only takes one explosion and immediately... He reveals himself. That's yeah, it. Yeah, he shows himself. And yeah. instead of killing our sort of villainous character, the swan who caused all of this for him, uh, they make a deal. 
Yeah, Swan Slick, man, with the Juicy Fruits gone, he needs someone to, you know, exploit musically, so he decides to cut a deal with the Phantom. I guess they're going to make that album after all. <laughs> he promises to let him do it his way, right? He promises to uh, let him choose who's going to sing it, and he gives him some studio time to get to work here. Yeah, but he also gives him a contract the size of a phone book that he drops on the Phantom's keyboard. It includes a transportation clause that allows Swan to control his mind, body, and soul, in another sentence that says, All articles which are excluded shall be deemed included. What does that mean? He also declares that the Phantom has to sign the contract in blood. Now, you'd think this might set off some alarm bells for a guy who wrote a whole cantata about Faust selling his soul to the devil, but he goes ahead and does it anyway. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> yeah, and the way that this contract's written and the sort of the style that you see, uh, I think as an audience member, I should have picked up a little more on who this contract he was signing was with. Um, I did want to go back to before the contract signed, we get some time with our Phantom in the booth, like doing some recording. And there's actually a really cool scene here where the Phantom can't really talk since the accident, but using the electronics and using the sound recording equipment, they're able to make his voice come clear again. They're able to make it so that he can communicate. Um, and this is where you definitely get your Darth Vader connections and rip off, right? Oh, you get the voice. Yeah, for sure. Swan's behind the control panel, just, you know, working dials and stuff and adding certain things, more filters and like it's making his voice sound human again. And I actually really, really like this scene. I thought it was really cool, that use of technology to, to make him communicate. Definitely. Now, unsurprisingly, Swan almost immediately double crosses him. As he bumps Phoenix, that's the singer that you mentioned earlier, was Winslow was so captivated by, into a backup role, even though he promised she could be the Phantom's voice. Instead, he's going to hand the songs over to a guitar-wielding glam rocker named Beef. <laughs> this, guy, this guy's name uh, is Beef. This interview process is pretty funny. He's sitting at the most obscene record-like table ever. It's amazing. The table is this giant round. It's like he's in, you know those like bowls they have in restaurants? where they give you, like, soup, and it's in this little tiny part of the, the thing, but the rest of it is just all border. It looks like a big plate around yeah, it. It's yeah, it's like that, and it's like a building that's a record, and he's sitting in the middle, and as he, like, kind of turns in this round thing, different musical acts, like, emerge from the shadows in just different styles are just there. Yeah, yeah, so he picks the genre that he thinks best, and he's going with glam rock. Yeah. So this is our future. Uh, I'm not upset. I love some good glam rock, so this is good. He's going to this sort of, like, rocky science fiction future kind of act. Yeah. And uh, I think we're going to get some good performances. This beef character brings a lot of showmanship. That's one way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> now, the Phantom has no idea this is happening because, as we see in kind of a dreamy aside, he's rewriting his cantata and has Phoenix on the brain. How do you feel about these like musical notes drifting into the screen and stuff? This is kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's a little animation. <laughs> I, I really liked a lot of the choices about the way they shot it, like the cinematography and the transitions and then some of the little things that they brought in to add to the tone and mood. I thought they did a really good job. Yeah, man, it's a cool sequence for sure. Now, after a brief press conference where Swan shows the world his beef, he checks it on the Phantom to pump him full of drugs and make sure the music will be finished by tomorrow night. He also has his goons start walling the Phantom in. They're literally building a brick wall over the only door in or out of the Phantom's studio. And from there, we go to rehearsals. How's the show looking so far, Noel? Oh, my goodness. So <laughs> I love that you slid that joke in and moved by. I liked it. Uh, the beef reference there. <laughs> um, the show is not looking great so far. Um, no. Beef is having some issues with the, the notes that he's supposed to be singing because it was clearly written for a woman. Uh, Swan tells him that he thinks he can make it his own and that he can do it. And, and Beef agrees as he sort of stumbles downstage, falls down, and then can't get up because his heels are too big. I was going to say, he's also having some trouble with his shoes. It's like essentially at the turtle on its back thing. He's trying to stand up and he can't. He does this kind of like awkward like half stand. It was pretty funny. But again, these weird like insertions of comedy or I don't know. Yeah, it, it was strange tonally. I mean, the Beef character, I think, is supposed to add levity in many ways to it. He's supposed to make it fun. Because we are getting pretty dark here at this point, right? We got the Phantom mm. uh, kind of melting down and falling in love and not getting what he wants. And Swan is sort of like masterminding this whole thing. You forgot to mention uh, Beef's stereotypical flamboyantly gay accent. Yeah, yeah. Beef has some problematic uh, characterizations for sure. I knew you were going to say that, but let's consider when this was made. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I think that that is how they would have assumed a, like, 
homosexual performer would have acted, and maybe they would have at that time. It takes a big man to admit when he's wrong. No, good for you. <laughs> but uh, the word problematic would be you wouldn't you wouldn't see a character maybe act like that today. I'm not sure. I don't know. You'd it, probably be decried for it if that's your only gay character, and they are doing the stereotypical like the lisp and everything else. You'd probably encounter some uh, pushback on that. Yeah. I tell you, though, he's a sharp guy because when the Phantom wakes up and realizes that Swan has once again stolen his music, he lets out a blood-curdling scream that Beef correctly identifies as the desperate scream of something that will not be stopped. He gets an up-close view of that in a second as we get a hilarious version of the shower scene from Psycho with Beef in the Janet Lee role. The Phantom slices through the shower curtain with a knife, but instead of stabbing Beef to death, he slaps a plunger over his mouth and tells him never to sing his music again because his music is just for Phoenix. This was fucking funny. Come on. Yeah, I really like this scene. Uh, I was expecting the stab. I was expecting it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then when that plunger came across and he threatened him. The look on his face when the plunger hits him with the big wide <laughs> eyes. That was fucking funny, man. <laughs> Beef had some good facial expressions in this. Yeah, yeah. Beef did for sure. Uh, so Beef is out of there, right? He's like, well, fuck this. I don't want to get killed by this Phantom. Clearly. I was right and the Phantom's still here haunting these halls and if this music was written only for Phoenix uh, I want to keep my life yeah but you know Swan's not going to have it Philbin catches Beef running and orders him to get back in there and do the show where the hell do you think you're going Tinkerbell Cincinnati to see my mother you're going to miss the show there ain't going to be no show you better get yourself together you got a show to do this is opening night can you still sing? Sure, I can still sing. Can help the fandom. Help! And what a show it is, as we start with what I would describe as a German kabuki performance by three guys who pretend to murder members of the audience and collect fake arms, legs, torsos, and heads. This is really something. <laughs> I like this performance, too. It reminded me a bit of Rocky Horror Picture Show. I mean, so much of this does, but this came out first, right? Like yeah. Not, I mean, I guess the Rocky Horror staged show, I think, was 73. This could have already been in production, but the Rocky Horror movie doesn't come out until 75. I don't know. It's impossible for me to watch this and not think of that, which I think is probably going to be a common reaction for a lot of people. Yeah, I think so, too. I, it makes me think that they were doing similar things at the same time, right? Both of these productions were probably creating this stuff around the same time. But um, this start where they piece together sort of a Frankenstein monster and then use electricity to bring it back alive on stage definitely had that connection for me. I really like the performance here. This one is one of my favorites. By Beef. A beef and by the like band that brings him and like puts him together. Okay, yeah. Um, I thought it was neat that it was the same three performers who take on the different bands over time. Yes, right? they they play the fucking uh, juicy fruits and yeah. also these beach guys. Yeah, they play the beach guys and then they play this uh, sort of black and white based performance as well. Yeah, I almost wonder if. When we watched Flash Gordon, we talked about how George Lucas ended up making Star Wars because he couldn't get the rights to Flash Gordon. I almost wonder if Brian De Palma like, wanted to make Rocky Horror Picture Show, couldn't get the rights, and did his own thing. You know what I mean? Ooh, that's a cool theory. That This would Possible? be similar in, in many, many ways. I wonder if he, yeah, he wanted to do it and didn't. That's that's really interesting. Because they came out so close together, it's, uh, possible? it's definitely possible. Know. Yeah, this, now... Again, I think maybe one of the strongest connections. You mentioned Beef's arrival is the Frankenstein monster thing. He comes to life, which immediately made me think of the Eddie scene in Rocky Horror Picture Show with Meatloaf. And, like, it's not really fair to this movie, but as I'm watching this, and I enjoyed the Beef performance too, but the, the Eddie scene and song is, like, way better. Mm. Hot Patootie, I'm like, this is a lesser version of that. <laughs> which is, again, not fair to this because it came out first. But yeah, in a similar turn of events, Beef is one and done here. He gets one song and the Phantom drops a light that electrocutes him and ends the performance once and for all. Yeah, you, you could cut in there before I could say that this performance was more electric than the... Uh, oh, the oh, Jesus. <laughs> all right. Uh, but yeah, I, I agree. It's sort of a second to that, that other performance. But I do like the Phantom... It, clearly breaks out of this cell that uh, had been created for him. Oh, yeah, we see that like, two guards lying there and a bunch of bricks on top of them. Yeah, this is... He kind of has superpowers, right? We've noticed that this character is absurdly strong for what he, he is, and I, I noted that because I thought it was interesting, but I guess the power of love and will will... The power of rage is that oh, temper yeah. of his. That's true. We'll take him there. Um, he drops this electric bolt sign, which is pretty hilarious. They used it to like show that the 
creature was being turned back into life, but it really does electrocute him when it crashes into him. Irony? <laughs> I guess I so. It ended him. He lights on fire, and they close the curtains, and the crowd loves it. Oh, yeah, they got a real hot crowd, and Beef is dead, so someone's going to have to go out there and perform. And that means Phoenix is going to get her moment, and does she ever make the most of it, belting out a song called Old Souls that brings the house down. So it sure seems like she's going to be a star. And despite seeming very grounded before, like we talked about, she is fully prepared to let Swan put it wherever he wants at this point, as long as he keeps letting her perform in front of these crowds. This seems like a very abrupt switch in her character. Yeah, I had a difficult time with this. Like, this bothered me because she was so, like, sure about herself, unwilling to do stuff before. But as soon as she had the taste for the crowd's reaction, she was willing to do whatever to get back out there. And I thought that didn't make sense to me. No, same. I mean, like... She's achieved this now. Why wouldn't he put her back out there? She's just like, she succeeds and then just completely submits to him, which is an odd choice, I think. It seems strange. Do you think her name had significance? She kind of comes out and rises from the ashes of beef. I was going to say, not her ashes, yeah. yeah. (laughs) But I don't know. And also kind of the ashes of the Phantom, really. Like, other people are getting wiped out and she's rising. I don't know if that's, maybe. I don't know. I thought it was just an interesting choice. There could be something there for sure. So, at this point, she's about to leave the paradise to go swim some swan when the phantom grabs her and pleads with her to walk away before swan destroys her you're crazy why should i go with you don't you hear them down there why should i give that up they want more now they want much more they want more than you could ever give he's about five minutes too late though and the next time we see her she's in bed with swan while the phantom sits on the roof having a good old-fashioned tug and cry (laughs) this is a very dark scene it is um Really, really dark. I I just wanted to pull back to the performance by her one second. I thought it was funny that the Phantom killed the light guy so that he could do the lighting on her. (laughs) I just thought that was an interesting inclusion. I didn't know why they did that. Poor light guy. He didn't do anything to anyone. He wanted to have the perfect lighting on Swan. Yeah, he's just there. He's he's just there doing his job. Yeah, I don't know. So Swan is laying in this big, like, circular waterbed with Phoenix, and uh, he's not very active. We've talked about this before in some of our movies. Uh, He's just laying there. 70s era sex scenes? Yeah. Yeah, So he's just laying there and she's kind of like leaning on him and giving him some kisses, sort of undoing his shirt. And he cares more about turning on his video cameras than this actual act of lovemaking. Yeah, I guess he likes to watch or he wants to know where the Phantom is and he sees him. Yeah. So he gets the connection. He can see the Phantom is above watching them. And then he sort of leans into it a little more. Uh, how does the Phantom feel about this lovemaking below? Oh, not good. He stabs himself in the heart right after he climaxes. But uh, as we see in a moment, <laughs> but as we see in a moment, he somehow isn't dead. And we find out why. See, according to the contract, the Phantom's body belongs to Swan until Swan is dead. There's no way out until then. So I guess Swan is actually the devil. Yeah, so this is where it became clear to me that he was, or... Well, but maybe not, though, because after the Phantom stabs Swan in the chest and nothing happens, he reveals that he, too, is under contract. Yeah, so maybe he's not the devil, but the devil is the one sort of controlling Swan, or this scene, which is really interesting. They've been laying the groundwork for it. Of course, the Faustian mention the fact that all the the record is called Death Records, and they have all that. (laughs) So... I mean, tons and tons of foreshadowing here, but for some reason, I I don't know why I didn't pull that out of there until this actual moment. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's kind of right there. It's kind of right there for you. Yeah, it felt embarrassing. I'm going to blame it on writing notes. That's fair. Yeah, it's happened (laughs) to me a time or two. Uh, So it seems at this point like the Phantom is totally fucked, but he refuses to give up and breaks into Swan's media room where he finds video footage of Swan selling his soul. He also finds video footage of his own contract signing and a different video of Swan convincing a possibly drugged up Phoenix to sign a contract of her own. She seems like not totally with it. Yeah, no, she's definitely on something when she he cuts her finger and she kind of signs it. But this sort of enrages our Phantom 2. Now he knows that his like object of affection, his love, is now under contract with this devil. Well, not only that, uh, the plan is for Swan to have her killed live on stage for the headlines. So now it's a race against time as the Phantom has to get to her before Swan's assassin pulls the trigger. Yeah, things start getting incredibly hectic here. We're going to get shots of what is supposed to be a wedding between Phoenix and Swan. And it is some kind of wedding. Yeah, oh my Um, god, yeah. And we also then will get cuts of our Phantom rushing from this sort of media room. Oh, dude is flying through those hallways. Uh, Before he leaves the media room, though, what does he do? Ah, so 
In the Swan video footage of him selling his soul, the devil mentions to Swan that as long as the video stays in one piece and stays safe, Swan will not age, he will not die. It's kind of a portrait of Dorian Gray situation. So the Phantom pulls a machine out of the wall, smashes it, it causes a fire to start, and now all of Swan's video footage is starting to burn, and all the contracts, I guess, are video contracts. This is going to eventually free, hopefully, everyone. As you mentioned, a lot of stuff happening here. All of these things are converging at once. The Phantom, of course, makes it there in time. He pulls the gun of the assassin, which causes the bullet to go right through the priest's forehead, which is a little bit dark. Yeah, it's pretty graphic. This sort of party that's happening is weird. There's a lot of... Like women in bikinis. Kind of uh, like Mardi Gras, or not Mardi Gras, like cabaret style. I don't know, what the fuck's it called? Uh, like carnival style dancers. Yeah, but they have sort of the uh, raven uh, bird heads on. Wings. And, and they're dancing around, and the crowd is really into it. Like when this murder happens, just like when the death of beef happened, the people all think it's a part of the show, right? They don't really think something else is wrong here, but... Phoenix immediately goes to check on this priest, and then Swan realizes something's wrong here. Oh, yeah. He turns to the camera, and we see his face is, like, melting because the the film is dissolving. Uh, The Phantom swings down to the stage to finish him off, but as a result of stabbing Swan, his own stab wound reopens, and that means he is not long for this world. Yeah, so we get Swan, who the crowd is now starting to take those raven masks and stab, and they're putting them up on their shoulders, and blood's flowing everywhere, and it's clear that he's dying. We also get our Phantom character, and he takes his mask off and is starting to crawl away. Uh, Some of the crowd members have put the mask on, and they're covered in blood, Um, but we know that he's also in trouble too, our, our Phantom here. Oh yeah, he's done, but he did what he came to do. Phoenix is safe. And she realizes who and what the Phantom was. Winslow Leach, a talented musician and lyricist who is not quite on the level of a Jess Robin from the jazz singer, but close. Can't believe you've done this to me. <laughs> what are you talking about? Don't don't compare this movie to the jazz singer. <laughs> Jess Robin, he, he wrote some hit songs. Come on. No, no, I'm not on it. Love on the Rocks? No. Hello again. Don't do this to me. America? <laughs> <laughs> so how Come would you on. feel if uh, if uh, that was the star of our movie? Neil Diamond? Yeah. As the f- oh, this would have been uh, 100% better. Oh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> either way, we're out, man. It's over now. We get footage of each character with more of those kind of marquee light credits from the beginning. And uh, yeah, man, this was just a weird, weird movie. Uh, yeah, it is a really, really strange movie. It wasn't quite what I was expecting. Um, I thought it would be... I don't know, slightly less dark. Like, I know that The Phantom of the Opera is, is quite dark, too. Yep. And, but for some reason, I felt like a, a rock opera version was going to be a little bit more... Uh, you, were expecting, you were expecting more glitter. Yeah. Yeah. I was expecting more glam, a little less darkness. But it was really, really interesting. Definitely, uh, having only seen it once now, a lot to reflect on. Like, I'm not even really sure what I'm going to rate this right now because... Oh, interesting. There is so much there. I did a little, like, pro and con or like and dislike section in my notes just to think about, but I, I'm really struggling with how I feel about this movie. Well, you better figure it out fast because we're pretty much at that point. It's time to get into our ratings. We do it the same way every time we do an episode. We rate it on a scale of 1 to 10 twice, once for how bad it is, once for how enjoyable, and the goal is to find movies that are a 10 out of 10 on both scale, or what we call the Crit Crit 20. 20, 20, 20, 20. And for me, I kind of don't think this movie is that bad. There's parts of it that are laughable. We didn't mention when we see the Phantom's face at the end, those effects, unlike when his face was like melting and smoking from the record press, the, the reveal of his face at the end, that's pretty bad. I some, agree. The makeup yeah. there is an excellent work. That's true. No, some of the performances are weird. The casting with this is really strange for me. Like, other than the guy who played Philbin, who looked and sounded and moved exactly like that character should, I feel like there was something strange about every other actor and performance. I think the Phoenix character was pretty good, too. Uh, I thought that was very was plain okay. to me. I don't know. She, there wasn't much to her. Like, she didn't seem to radiate the star quality that she eventually ended up kind of attaining. I think that was probably time-based too, right? Like I feel like in the 70s, her look was what a female, like a star female singer would be. But I think I can see what you're saying. Yeah, so that was an issue for me. But like overall, it tells the Phantom of the Opera story with like a new twist. The costumes were interesting. The sets were really cool. Some of the set design, just the the things they built, that record table, the level rooms, like the, 
I don't know why they kept putting small doors in there, but a lot of the doors were strange. <laughs> like it was very Willy Wonka. It was, yeah, and it, it kind of creates this kind of like fun house or like this weird effect. I, but yeah, I thought that was really interesting. So overall, like I think it does a good job telling the story in a different and unique way. So kind of casting aside and some of the makeup visual effects, I only have this as a seven bad. Okay, that's fair. Um, without having seen it and coming in, I was kind of hoping that this would be crit twenty potential. But I have to agree with you. Um, pretty early on in this, I felt like this isn't 10 bad material. There was a lot of things that I liked. Um, I, of course, I really liked the music, uh, the costuming, like you said. The interesting architecture or set design was pretty cool. I thought the creation of the Phantom and the use of the sound equipment and electronics to be able to make him talk again, I thought that it was just way too well done. Um, I... I had it as an eight bad okay. for you. And I thought the things that took away from it for me, I thought the makeup was a bit of a struggle at times compared to the costuming. Like I liked when they hid and kept everything behind. But as soon as you saw those effects, when he got stabbed, the blood work was just it, yeah, that atrocious. bright red. Yeah, yeah. It, didn't, it didn't work for me. Uh, some of the speed that events happen in the movie, um, some of the chaos of it, I know a lot of that is intentional choice, but I also felt some of it may have been a little too quick. In particular, that part that was like two minutes to tell the story of his downfall. It was like the Showgirls thing. Like in Showgirls, we had that two-minute sequence where all this stuff happens to her just to get to the point of the story they want to tell. Yeah, and for a 90-minute movie, like I think they could have spent five more minutes in there. Like it didn't have to be like crazy long or anything, but I, I would have liked a little bit more time to catch my feet as a viewer, I think, and all of that stuff happening. Um, but so in terms of bad, I said an eight in enjoyability. Yeah. How enjoyable did you find it? Yeah, I, I was, I was in the whole time. So I was locked in. I was interested to see what would happen. The music kept me in there too. I liked a lot of the sets and the performances that they did. Even the very first performance, there's like 50 style one that they were immediately moving away from. I enjoyed, right? It was one of those that, that was entertaining. Yeah. It was fun. Um, so I, I really did enjoy myself a lot. A little bit of the chaos or choices around, especially the Phoenix character. Um, I was a little annoyed that I also didn't realize that it, they were dealing with the devil. <laughs> that was almost yeah. like, <laughs> you're losing some enjoyability because yeah. you made me feel stupid. Um, but I, I would watch it again, which doesn't happen that often on our podcast. I would like to see it again. This had a lot of potential. Uh, I thought at points that it was going to be a 10, but by the end of it, I had settled on a 9. So 9 enjoyable. Okay, so I also have it as a nine. We're really close to these again. This is one of those weeks where we're very much in sync. Um, yeah, like weird, but in a good way. Yeah. There's yeah. not a lot of movies I've seen that are like this. I think some of that is time. I think some of it is material. I think some of that is the director's vision. Like, say what you will, like Brian De Palma is a pro. Like, you know what I mean? He he knows he's got his vision for this movie and he's making the vision happen. So the music is weird for me. I liked the music. But I feel like it didn't really relate to what was happening in the movie. Like, it's, I, I have a hard time calling this a musical because while there are musical performances, they're kind of detached from the main story. Like, the music plays a part in the story in the sense that they are, he's a music producer, they are musicians trying to have a career, but the songs don't actually connect with the narrative. So that, for me, was a little bit weird, but I still enjoyed the songs. I think the reason why it wasn't a 10 for me, and again, it's kind of unfair, I found myself comparing it to Rocky Horror Picture Show the whole time. Like, when that movie came out a year later, Brian De Palma must have been like, fuck! Because <laughs> at that point, like, you know, massive hit. Um, Rocky Horror, obviously, in my opinion, had much better songs. Plus, I mean, Tim Curry, how do you compete with that, right? But overall, yeah, like, enjoyable for how weird it was. Especially, again, I go back to the set design was really cool. And, like, some of the performances, it just really interesting. Interesting movie. I will watch it again as well, for sure. Um yeah, this was a fun one to yeah, go back to. I think you're right. I think uh, as a fun movie, as a movie to enjoy to watch, Rocky Horror definitely is is a better movie. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? And and I love that movie. Um, but this one is a more interesting movie to watch. Like right? mm. the choices that they went with are um, way more out there, which, which makes it fun, right? I like how interesting that is. Um, in terms of like having a good time, this is not a good time feels movie. There oh, are, no, it's there not. Are, yeah. There are sections in there that kind of feel that way, but I I think that's what I was expecting. So because of that, my expectations were were not quite met, but I still really in, enjoyed the watch and would do it again. Well, clearly, yeah. Now, uh, how about this beer? Good time beer or what? Yeah. I think it might be sort of their flagship lager, right? And I think this is sort of standard, and they've done a really good job with it. I think a lot of breweries, because lagers are such a popular type of beer, 
they have to find one that they can make that's like really good and people will come back and keep drinking. And I think that they've achieved that with this. Um, it, this is something that if you wanted to have a few of them and watch a, like a baseball game or something, I would definitely be a good go-to. Oh, for sure. And I like, for me, I, it's just nice to have a craft lager, right? So much of craft beer for the longest time, just IPAs, pale ales, that's all it was because you can get lagers. There's macro companies making lagers. Lagers are what you traditionally drink, like, you know, from the beer store, from whatever. So to have a, a craft brewery make just a clean, crisp lager, that's right in my wheelhouse. It's fantastic. And thank goodness we're drinking this today because I am extremely hungover from uh, some drinking I did last night. So this was <laughs> the best thing I can say about this was. I'm I, not in a worse place than when I started. This actually is kind of bringing me back up to zero here. I was going to say, this here. is a beautiful yeah. hair of the dog for you right here. Oh, it's per, it's the perfect beer for that. So if you're hungover and have to drink for a movie and beer podcast, this is the beer for you. There's, oh. my, there's my quote. <laughs> I'm sure that's the advertisement Grove's going to go with. We're going to give that to them if they want it. Yeah, put that on a poster. No, man, it's cool, though. It's, it's good stuff, and I've had a few more of their beers I enjoyed. So check out the Grove Brew House in Kingsville, Ontario. It's like in the Windsor area, give or take. Yeah, yeah, just a little south of the Windsor area. Which is right next to Detroit if you're American. Come across yeah. the border. Have some Windsor pizza. It's good stuff. <laughs> All right, well, what are we getting into next week? Well, next week, we kind of alluded to this last week in Under Siege, but next week, we're going to be spending a little more time with Erica Leniak. We're going to be watching Tales from the Crypt, Bordello of Blood. We covered <laughs> Demon Knight in our first season. Now we're going to go for the second Tales from the Crypt movie. Uh, Dennis Miller, for some reason, Corey Feldman, <laughs> Erica Leniak, and uh, the uh, just unforgettable Angie Everhart. Yeah, so Bordello of Blood, this is vampires, I can only assume. Yeah, hookers. <laughs> vampire uh prostitutes oh nice okay i'm looking forward to this one i haven't seen this one so uh, oh you'll enjoy there's lots of boobs so you'll be you'll be good with it yeah <laughs> yeah that is what i'm always looking for in a movie oh uh, you admitted it finally yeah no about time in this movie huh no it's like for a minute there there's gonna be some when all those ladies were on swans uh you know yeah a lot of talk bit. about sex but no none shown was that common in the 70s or was the 70s like free love i thought they were showing everything i mean you couldn't go too far with it without getting the x rating and then you know you're just not gonna, uh, not gonna happen, so this is so. more about yeah just like getting it out there yeah probably but next week you'll have plenty of nudity to enjoy uh, if you have not already, please follow us on social media, on Twitter and Instagram, at the BMB Podcast. Yeah, feel free to send any comments, some suggestions for movies and our beer to those uh, accounts, or to send us an email at thebnbpodcast at gmo.com. Yes, we've got an audience request coming up uh, very soon. We hope you will join us next week for Tales from the Crip Bordello of Blood. Thank you for listening. I'm Cooper. And I'm Nolan. And we'll see you next time on Bad Movies and Beer. Keep it beefy. <laughs> <laughs> He sold his soul for rock and roll.